Welcome back. Hello there, welcome back to the Pacific War Channel, the channel where we cover the entire history of the Asia Pacific War from 1937 all the way up to 1945, and all the major events that led up to it. Not gonna lie, a lot of you are probably them Gen Z TikTok types who have, you know, the memory span of a goldfish. How do you do, fellow kids? But for those of you, you know, who don't know what this is, this is a tier list. And I'm going to be ranking some generals of the Pacific War that my audience chose, and a few notable characters I threw in there myself, just to give it a little bit of diversity. Now, yes, you're probably looking at me and saying, why are you wearing the freaking sunglasses? Maybe you're watching too much Critical Drinker, which I absolutely am. <laughs> But, uh, you know what, if you really hate it, uh, let me know. Leave it in the comments down below, and uh, perhaps you can even put a like, subscribe to this small but growing channel just to help me out. But without further ado, since a lot of you probably are Gen Zs and don't have any patience past two minutes. Is that like a personal attack or something? Better get on with it. First guy on our list, General Thomas Blamey. Now, he served in World War I and World War II. He's the only Australian to attain the rank of Field Marshal. He began World War II serving in the Middle East. Made quite a few mistakes, but you know what, overall he did a pretty good job. Especially when he was spanking the Vichy French forces in Syria. <laughs> when the war came to the Pacific, he was made Commander-in-Chief of the Australian Military Forces. But he was better forced to work with, or as I might argue, work under, General Douglas MacArthur. And the Kokoda Track campaign, it was kind of a catastrophe. Blamey was literally tossed over to Port Moresby to be a scapegoat, and he had to take control of the New Guinea forces. He had to fight both the Japanese and MacArthur, who, you know, used Prime Minister Curtin to coerce Blamey into sacking a lot of his own commanders. It's kind of a, a douchebag thing to do. Despite the terrible odds against him, Blamey had a successful New Guinea campaign. And hell, during the Buna Gona Sandananda campaign, he got to throw some mud in MacArthur's face, which puts some points in my book. Blamey was a hard drinker, not a womanizer, while MacArthur overshadowed him, you know, heavily, and thus he didn't get to see much of the limelight. Where to place him? And it really is hard to place the first guy on the list, but I'm gonna have to give him a solid B. Badass. Hey everyone, I just wanted to let you know I now have a Patreon account found at www.patreon.com slash the Pacific War channel. Over there you can find exclusive Patreon episodes and podcasts based on suggestions from patrons, and other benefits like early access to all of my content, live hangouts, your name in the end credits, and much, much more. So please go check it out. Not too, too good. Not too bad. I think B's pretty good for this guy. Second guy on the list, General Joseph Stilwell, also known infamously as Vinegar Joe. It's vinegar. What? It's vinegar, puss. Another guy who served in both world wars, Vinegar Joe spoke and wrote Chinese. But my god, did he not understand the culture. The adventures of Vinegar Joe and Peanut, that was his nickname for Chiang Kai-shek, were so legendary that a lot of books were written on his relationship with him alone. He's kind of similar to Blamey, actually. He had to fight the Japanese and Chiang Kai-shek's meddling. And one might argue the British as well. Joseph Stilwell really didn't like the British. Mr. Joe was responsible for pulling much of the effort and resources to the CBI theater, as pertaining to the Lend-Lease Agreement. And he had a terrible hand dealt to him, honestly. Burma was an absolutely, uh, it was smashed at the beginning. And uh, his command of the Chinese Expeditionary Forces was not easy. He had little actual control over the forces given to him, and he was constantly being lied to and messed around with by Chiang Kai-shek. He spent the entire war crying into his diary, and complaining about Chiang Kai-shek and the British to Washington. He was a stubborn asshole, and while he did make many mistakes, he also called out a ton of bullshit. Duh, you know, during Operation Ichigo, uh, which was the nail in his coffin, honestly, as Chiang Kai-shek finally got enough reasons to sack him well that was kind of the end of him um as a general i'd say he was uh pretty good a soldier soldier as some would say but his interpersonal skills were utter shit i have people skills i am good at dealing with people can't you understand it what the hell is wrong with you people he was completely incapable of working with others and um man to place him 
gonna sound like a bit of a cop out, but I am gonna have to place him right alongside Blamey. Badass! But I am gonna put him under Blamey, because at least Blamey could somewhat work with people. And I mean, Blamey had to work with Douglas MacArthur, which takes like the patience of an angel, mind you. Next up on our list is a kind of a favorite of mine, General Bill Slim. Yet again, another man who served in both world wars. And you are hard pressed to find anyone who does not like this commander, by the way. And he infamously led the uh, what was called the Forgotten Army. He had a good taste of war. He served notably at Gallipoli during World War I, which was an absolute shit show. Then in World War II, he helped liberate Ethiopia. And he served in the Middle East before he was shipped over to Burma. This guy had to deal with an absolute asshole. This moron named Erwin Noel. Who royally screwed up the Arakan campaign and kept Slim away because he, well, he simply hated him over some kindergarten bullshit. Short story, oh, long story short as they would say. Uh, yeah, Bill kind of got one of his friends court-martialed and uh, anyways, guy had never let it go. Uh, it took a while for Slim to earn the damn respect that he deserved and he certainly trained his boys for, you know, the type of jungle fighting that was necessary to win in places like Burma. And, uh, you know, he was alongside a lot of other moronic British generals and he's one of the few that, you know, he's one of the few that kind of like did a good job, honestly. Uh, Slim was utterly loved by the men under him and he was the quintessential soldier soldier. He did something generals rarely do. He criticized his own performance, particularly during the Burma campaign. And to be honest, he was just a badass motherfucker. And uh, I, I couldn't help myself, but I'm gonna just launch him right, right into S. Savage. I don't think anyone would argue with that. The guy was awesome. Oh, here's someone that I put on the list myself. And I am going to admit biases, uh, I particularly like Tomoyuki Yamashita. So General Tomoyuki Yamashita is probably one of my favorite generals of World War II. He had to face the Allies alongside Hideki Tojo, who went out of his way to screw with Yamashita throughout the war. They had a huge rivalry. Yamashita's application of what he learned in Germany prior to the war, particularly that of Blitzkrieg tactics, well, True international ever pressure. Blitzkrieg tactics are legendary when it comes to the Milan campaign and the fall of Singapore. His bicycle Blitzkrieg absolutely rocked the Allied defenders, and his bluff at the Battle of Singapore is simply incredible. Getting Arthur Percival to surrender to his force that was basically one third his size, while he was critically low in ammunition and supplies, pure badass. Try to imagine this man's poker face, as he did have to sit at the end of the table with Arthur Percival and have a poker face. He rightfully earned the title, the Tiger of Malaya. Now, as far as the war crimes trial goes, I'm not going to sit here and say that he was completely innocent, but I will say many of the charges laid against him probably were false. Some of them, not all. Well, it was a horrible thing because I did nothing wrong. Uh, Tsuichi Masinobu, who was responsible for many of the orders that, you know, performed atrocities that were done under Yamashita, without his knowledge, mind you, uh, greatly blemished Yamashita's career. And he would be executed as a result of this at the end. Did he deserve the execution? It's a tough one. Because while many of the atrocities probably did come by the orders under him, maybe some by him himself, he still most likely, uh, I mean, I'm not going to lie, he probably had a hand in a few of them. It's impossible to really know the responsibility because uh, at the end of the war, everyone was lying. Uh, but when it comes to uh, his actions in the Philippines, it seems he was guilty of some things. Uh, he was robbed later by, you know, Tojo, who exiled his ass to Manchuria by the end. And then, you know, at the very end, sacrificed him in the Philippines. So he had a rough time of it at the end of the war. He's a really complex man with uh, extremely rare qualities amongst the Japanese leadership. And, um, I'm sorry. He's probably going to be going right up top here, and he's gonna, probably going to sit in that spot for me. Savage! And uh, you can argue with me in the comments, and uh, you can call him a war criminal and everything you want. He probably was. I did it. Yeah, yeah I, I know you did it. Yeah, we all know you fucking did it. Okay, but we can get you off. We Guilty? I'll fucking do it again. Okay, uh, but, you know, there was a lot of things lobbed against him that, again, I'd say that I think there's a lot of false accusations. But definitely he was responsible for some things. But, I mean, compared to a lot of his colleagues, I mean, he was kind of an angel. But that's not saying much. Ah, next on our list, General Sun Rien. He served during the Pacific War and the Chinese Civil War. 
He was a graduate of Virginia Military Institute, and he led his troops during China's Stalingrad, as you would call it, the Battle of Shanghai in 1937. Hell of a time fighting that one. It was an inferno. Now, where does he go from that bloodbath? To Burma. It's kind of a theme right now. A lot of guys who went to Burma in this. He received a lot of attention from Vinegar Joe, who, might I add, thought that he was the most capable Chinese field commander during the entire war. And General Slim respected him greatly. Soon earned a ton of fame launching headfirst against Chiang Kai-shek's wishes to save the British at the Battle of Yenang Yuan. It was a hell of a bold move, earning him Commander of the British Empire Medal. Soon spearheaded the Burma campaign under Vinegar Joe, and he got an invitation from Dwight D. Eisenhower to tour the battlefields of Europe. Have to say, the amount of respect for this guy gained from Western countries is tremendous, and it showcases his abilities. Though, to be honest, his educational background and his ability to speak English fluently played a large role in that. He was one of the few Chinese generals who did. English, motherfucker, do you speak it? I don't want to push too much into the Civil War area because I am the Pacific War guy, but I will have to note, despite Chiang Kai-shek kind of not trusting this guy, he was kept around. Kind of like um, Stalin with Zhukov after the war. Uh, he earned a nickname, Rommel of the East, which I think says a lot about him. Now, as for how I would place this guy, I'm going to have to say, I think he's our first A tier. Apocalyptic. Can't can't justify him being an S tier because he had limited control, limited battles that he actually performed, whereas some of the commanders here performed entire campaigns. I mean, uh, Tomiyuki Mashta, for example. I think he's comfortable in A tier. Ah, here we go. Got a Dutch guy. So General Heinz Borten. <laughs> Here's a tasty little lager that came all the way from Holland. Well, beggars can't be choosy. I apologize to my Dutch audience. I didn't mean to say it like that. Oh, God. Dutch hater. Anyways, uh, I wanted to diversify the list a bit, so I tossed him in there. And, you know, when I was thinking about Dutch generals, you had to pick good old Heinz de Porten. Uh, he was dealt probably the worst hand during the Pacific War. He had to work with, uh, sorry to say, the bottom of the barrel of the forces and materials that his government in exile could give him. Still, he was appointed commander of the land forces for the very short-lived... A, B, D, A command, so Abda command, and he had a lot of flaws. Uh, for one thing, he was incapable of working alongside civil leadership, so the uh, the governor general uh, hated him in the Dutch East Indies, I mean really hated him, and he inevitably had to command the forces at the last hurrah for the Dutch in the Pacific, which was the battle for Java, which was a colossal failure, and um, well, all the battles the Dutch fought were kind of hopeless. Uh, they were outnumbered, outgunned, undertrained, and um, underprovisioned. He was forced to lead a doomed defense. What, what more can you say? Did he surrender at the outright of the war? No, he did not. He very well could have. But it, you know, what was his government exile going to say about it? In the end, he, um, you know, he surrendered when he kind of had to, and uh, yeah, I th I'd say he was pretty bold. Uh, he spent the rest of the war as a POW, and. Um, I mean, he kind of became the scapegoat for the defeat of the Dutch East Indies, which sucks for him. Arguably, though, he did what was right, I would say. Still, uh, the campaigns that he led, uh, pretty catastrophic. Uh, I don't want to put him in, like, F tier. I think that's a little bit harsh, but good old dog shit D tier might be where this guy belongs. Dismal. I don't know if I'm being too harsh, but that's, that's where I'm putting him. Sorry. To the Dutch. There are only two things I can't stand in this world. People who are intolerant of other people's cultures and the Dutch. What? General Alexander Vandegrift. Oh. Oh, you can't have a Pacific War list without this guy. I mean, we gotta represent the Marines somehow, right? So uh, he uh, gets his claim to fame starting with, you know, the Guadalcanal campaign. Vandegrift led the 1st Marine Division, getting, you know, America's first taste of island hopping warfare during the Solomon Islands campaign. And, uh, you know, he had to be the guy leading the men to perform many of the firsts. So, you know, during a time when Japan was absolutely battering everywhere across the map, uh, he had to jump into the fray. It was an extremely bold move by America to sneak over on a Guadalcanal. 
where Vandegrift would receive the Medal of Honor for keeping his forces together and successfully tossing back repeated Japanese offenses against Henderson Field. Yes, he is the earner of the Medal of Honor. The Allies had no idea how to perform amphibious assaults, and Vandegrift had to tackle this colossal task headfirst. I don't want to get too much into the rivalry between the Marines and the soldiers, mind you, uh, but there is a good reason the Marines were kept longer than necessary on some of the islands. Cough, cough, Guadalcanal. And that is a testament to Vandegrift's leadership. Unlike many of his colleagues, Vandegrift had experience with China prior to the Pacific War, much like General Rupertus, who served under him. He led the way after the Solomons commanding the 1st Marine Amphibious Corps, an extremely important command, before he got, you know, command of the Marine Corps. And, uh, I mean, what can I say? He's a legend of the Pacific War. Um, every single American would kill me if I didn't put him in S tier. I'll put him in front of Bill. Savage! I'll put him in front of Bill, but I can't put him in front of you, Master. You can, uh, you can argue with me in the comments if you want to kill me, but that's where I'm going to put him. So, there uh, you're is... Wrong. You're wrong. Ah. Lieutenant General Masahare Homa. The man responsible for conquering the Philippines against Dugout Duck. Known as the Poet General, he had a lighter hand than most of his colleagues. He ordered his men to treat the Filipino civilians pretty well, which earned him a lot of grief from his colleagues, mind you, and his superiors. They did not like that. Similar to Yamashita, Colonel uh, Tsuji Masunobu sent orders under him, in his name, unbeknownst to him, to perform atrocities, mo most notably the execution of Manuel Roxas. He royally messed up during the Battle for Bataan, and on multiple occasions he was forced to demand reinforcements from high command to try and break that stalemate in Bataan, which earned him, uh, well, God, they wanted to sack him for this. Uh, he, got the he, he got the bad end of the stick when it came to, you know, his best division being taken from him and replaced with a, what we would call a garrison brigade, uh, the weekend warrior types, uh, which really messed with his Bataan campaign. The entire Japanese timetable for the war plans was, you know, undone by Homa failing to take Bataan on time, and he would eventually be replaced by Yamashita. Uh, Homa, like Yamashita, was put on war crimes, uh, put for war crimes, because I'm an idiot who can't speak. I was going to put him in... Uh, foot, foot. And, uh, you know, it was for allowing the Bataan Death March to occur. Though, arguably, if you know about the Bataan Death March, um, it's more of him not knowing what was going on. He didn't put specific orders in place that allowed for what happened to happen. So, again, how responsible was he for such a thing? A lot of controversy uh, there. Um, his execution sentence was also controversial. With point, you know, a lot of people pointed fingers at MacArthur, uh, thinking that he was taking revenge on Homa because it was Homa who defeated MacArthur in the beginning after MacArthur completely screwed up the defense of the Philippines. Where to place this guy? Uh, I'm sorry to say, I think I'm gonna have to put him in the B tier. Badass. And oof, no, no, he's going behind these guys. Yeah, he, he, it's not like he was a terrible general. Ah, B, B's good enough for him. Yeah, good enough for him. Oh, General Peng Duai. This guy had a really long career, spanning from the foundations of the KMT, uh, the Warlord Era, the Second Sino-Japanese War, the Chinese Civil War, the Korean War, and then he served in the CCP, you know, until Mao Zedong sacked him. I don't want to play with you anymore. Uh, he served under a lot of different leaders. I mean, we got Chiang Kai-shek, we got various warlords like the Jade Marshal, Wu Pei Fu, and then well, Mao Zedong. Uh, his service to Chiang Kai-shek was pretty short-lived as he tossed a lot of it in with, you know, Wang Jingwei and... Yeah, this guy was kind of a flip-flopper. And he gradually shifted over at the end to the CCP. I guess he had the foresight to see that they would win in the end. But yeah, he was kind of juggling Chiang Kai-shek, he went with Wang Jingwei, and then he ended up with Mao Zedong. Uh, he made a quick name for himself as a Red Commander. Uh, but when the Second Sino-Japanese War broke out and the Second United Front began, he was made, you know, an NRA general. Which was, uh, it showed that he had ability. Unlike Mao Zedong, Peng used, you know, he really wanted to fight the Japanese, uh, rather than just biding their time to fight the NRA later, which definitely was what they were doing. Uh, and he ended up um, helping a former warlord, Yang Jishan, against the Japanese. Uh, he led the men of the 8th Route Army. I am Groot. 
Sprout. Why would? It's weird how I pronounce things sometimes. You can say in the comments down below what a moron I am. And uh, he led the famous 100th Regiment Offensive. Uh, it's the largest communist operation against the Japanese during the war. And uh, it really pissed off Mao Zedong. Uh, Pong had to eat a lot of shit from Mao for his unauthorized offensive. And he would spend most of the war doing more politics and military stuff because he was trying to save his own life. Still, uh, juggling a war against the Japanese, the NRA, and Mao Zedong politically, the man was definitely a survivor, say that much of him. And, um, where to put him? I think just because he survived so many situations that should have seen him killed, and I mean, this is more political stuff than military, eh, I think he's gonna go, not, not top A, but he's gonna go right beside uh, another Chinese counterpart. Apocalyptic! Oh boy. And uh, anyone who listens to the podcast I'm part of knew I was going to put good old Dougie on this list, and I, le I, le I left him for last. Yeah, for good reason. Sorry, MacArthur was just insane. He was like, what if we just, like, nuked all of Southeast Asia? General Douglas MacArthur, America's Caesar. Many of you clicked this thumbnail, probably because you thought I was going to spend it shit-talking Dougie. And, uh, what can I say? I've been really critical of America Caesar. The greatest general of all time, as some would say. He's probably one of the most well-known. Uh, I'm not going to talk about things like, you know, him going bananas in Korea and stuff later. Let's just keep it to the Pacific. But, uh, he completely blundered the Philippines' defensive operation. Uh, he pressured commanders during the Bunagona campaign because of his own political ambitions, resulting in unbelievable amounts of death that were unnecessary. Uh, he enriched himself secretly, vied for presidency before, during, and after the Pacific War. And he went out of his damn way to influence the entire Pacific War to save his own goddamn reputation, to promote himself in order to earn more money, fame, and, you know, his ultimate goal, which was the presidency. He could not accept any of his mistakes, which were numerous. Take the uh, Clark Field disaster. Yeah, listen. Uh, we fucked up. The Philippine Beach Defense disaster. Or his unwillingness to apply War Plan Orange 3 on time disaster. Hell, the, man made, the, the men under him made a song mocking him during the Battle for Bataan. Yes, he absolutely was an asshole. He made a ton of mistakes during the Pacific War. I particularly don't like how he treated poor Lieutenant General Wainwright, especially, you know, when he was opposing his Medal of Honor. But he is called America's goddamn Caesar for a reason. Let's show them some good old-fashioned American swagger. This prima donna was unbelievably brave. He risked his neck many times throughout his long and very colorful career. For better or worse, he became the face of the American fight in the Pacific. He did indeed return to the Philippines, though making that detour arguably killed more Americans than it had to. Honestly, he's the type of character who gets an S rank or an F rank from 99% of the people who would rank him. But I'm going to slap him square in. In the middle. Right in the sea. Holy, get what you fucking deserve! And the reason why I'm gonna do that is because I know, because I know the man quite well, it's almost like we were married or something with the amount of books I've read about him, that putting him in S or F would please him. Because he'd think, you know, it's either his critics or the people that love him, but putting him in C rank, that would piss him off the most. Is that like a personal attack or something? <laughs> really, it truly would piss him off. Uh, jeez, I really hope you like this. I hope I'm not too cringy with these freaking sunglasses that I kept on the whole time, mind you. I was planning on taking them off at some point. Uh, if you really like this kind of content, you know, let me know. I'll, uh, do it again. Maybe with some admirals. Maybe I'll rank some ships. I don't know, you guys let me know. Please leave a like, and for the love of God, leave some comments in this video. It helps the algorithm, as the YouTube gods of algorithm have been just smashing me with a hammer ever since I started making YouTube shorts. Can't express enough how much that is making it hard to uh, be on YouTube right now. And, uh, well, you Gen Z TikTok types, this has been the Pacific War Channel, over and out.